Brian and Rudy, where are we? Well, this morning, Brian, we're at the Florida Iguana and Tortoise Breeders Forum, uh, owned by Sam Scucci here to my left. And to my right, your right, Brian, is Robert De Palma, our curator of Vervet Paleontology. And with us was, number one, a Galapagos tortoise, one of the uh, senior members of the farm here. Let's see if we can catch up with them, and Robert will explain a few things about dinosaurs and reptiles, how they're similar and how they're dissimilar. You know, what a lot of people don't realize about dinos, they're described as being scaly creatures, very reptilian, but their scales are different than most reptile scales. Uh, they're not overlapping like fish scales or lizard scales or anything. What they are closest to, actually, are the scales on this Galapagos tortoise right here. You see you've got this series of hexagonal plates, essentially, and there are these little raised mounds on his skin. They've got some wrinkles around the edges, but they're not overlapping. All these scales are just adjacent to one another, and they are almost identical to this scale pattern from the duckbill dinosaur, and those scales are non-overlapping as well. And so what you'll see with these guys is you'll see larger scales right around the areas that don't bend or anything like that, and where do you see the wrinkles, where your leg is going to bend, you've got all these smaller scales like that, and they kind of feed into the wrinkles. So. When I'm reconstructing a dinosaur and when I'm sculpting what the dinosaur looked like when it was alive, after all those muscles go on the bone, I look at creatures like this to understand what that thing's going to look like, and I can sculpt it accurately. Well, what type of animal is there? What we have here is a uh, Cuban iguana, uh, Cyclora nubila nubila, and this is Humphrey, and he's about uh, 22 years old. Nice. Robert. Well. These guys are our modern dinosaurs, if ever there was one. And uh, these guys are, I mean, just look at them. It's like Godzilla when you look at their faces. But uh, in reality, there are a lot of differences between these iguanas and dinosaurs. I'll give you an example. This is a replica of a dinosaur skull. This is Nano Tyrannus, related to T. rex. And uh, this is what your typical carnivorous dinosaur would look like. Now, Humphrey's skull looks something like this. So, you've got a lot of similarities here. You've got the diapsid skull that I was talking about before, where you've got the two openings in the skull. This lower opening here, and the upper one right there. Now, with the nano, there you've got the lower opening, and here you've got the upper opening. But you notice that uh, you've got the eye socket here. In front of the eye socket in the nano, you've got this opening. That's the antiorbital fenestra. You don't have that in the iguana. That's all closed up. And also, the teeth in the nano are like laterally compressed steak knives. They're serrated like a shark's tooth, and they are meant for slicing through meat and grabbing it. But uh, if you got in with a magnifying glass, these iguana teeth are like little leaves. They got a couple of little bumps on them, a couple of little serrations, but they are like uh, almost like arrowheads, and those are meant for shearing off vegetation and things like that. You also notice that uh, this lower opening in the iguana skull is completely open. It goes right down to the jaw. Not so in the dino. We've got this other bar that forms down there from the jugal and the quadratojugal, and that frames the bottom of this fenestra, and it's not so in lizards. So they might look kind of similar on the outside, but on the inside, these things are really distinct, and uh, this is a very derived kind of creature. Hey, where are we now? Well, Brian, we're at the lab now of the Florida Iguana and Tortoise Breeders. Inside, you have all of the juvenile uh, tortoises. You also have the eggs in their incubators. Uh, Sam and Robert are inside. Why don't we go join us, Brian? All right. Okay, let's go. Oh, these are pretty cute little turtles, so why are they different than the other? Actually, they're the same species. It's an elongated tortoise. And this one is uh, a leucistic tortoise, and this one is a, a normal-looking tortoise. This has a, a gene uh, deficiency, which does not allow it to have the same coloration that this animal does. You can see it's much lighter in color. The skin is much lighter. Even if you turn them over, they have a different color of their uh, yeah, flash drop. All right, so we're here with all these incubators, and uh, you've got different ones for different eggs. And part of that is because temperature affects what gender your uh, animal is going to become. So, Sam, tell me a little bit about that. Well, what we do is we incubate, if we want females, we incubate about 89 degrees. If we want uh, males, we incubate about 84, 85 degrees. And uh, that, that way we can control the sex of your incubation. We can pretty much judge that uh, a lot of the reptiles back in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic did the same thing, but we're not entirely certain what the dinosaurs did. We're, we sort of think that they are uh, more along the line of modern birds, 
and which temperature does not affect the gender so much. But again, we're not entirely certain about that. That's why studying these eggs and the structure of these eggs help us to develop theories about what dinosaurs might have done. Yeah, something else that we've noticed here on the farm is that obviously um, the, the uh, tortoises don't know that the eggs are going to be incubated. And what we've seen is we've seen they'll actually change the depth that they make that, that nest. So, you know, there, there's probably some uh, realization there to, to, to uh, yielding males and females in that nest. And so if they want females, they may put them higher to the surface. And if they want males, they may put them down uh, lower in the ground. So that's one theory that... Uh, that, uh, we're looking to see. So they might be regulating the construction of their nests exactly. to regulate the, right. the ratios of male female. Right. Well, we know they regulate for, for the rainy season. If they're laying in the rainy season, they'll, they'll dig the nest up higher rather than lower. So we've seen that happen as well. Very cool. Very cool. Cool, they're hatching. Yeah, these are little African spur thighs, and they're hatching out of their eggs right now. You see the little guy sticking his leg out of that one right there, coming out of the egg. So cute. That guy's moving over there. All right, so this is like our version of John Hammond with the uh, dinos in Jurassic Park. You see, there's a little, there's a little front limb of this tortoise poking right out of the shell right there. He's he's hatching right now as we're watching. So these little guys are all ready to pop out of the egg. You see, he's moving in there. If you look down here to the other side, this little guy is on his way out too. Let's see what he's doing in there. Look, there's his little shell. Oh, there's his little head. He is seeing sunlight for the very first time in his life, and there he is, poking his way out of that little egg right there. And Sam, what kind of turtles are these? These are African spur thigh turtles. African spur thigh. So the same ones that we were looking at before that had the uh, genetic anomalies. This is them coming right out of the egg. Let's get, let's get a look at this little guy. See his little face in there? Check that out. That is one of the cutest, cutest things of all time. And so he will hatch, and his yolk sac will resorb back in the body, and the shell will close over, and then Sam will raise him up, and uh, who knows, he might be a breeder one day, not sure. So we were talking about genetic anomalies before, and different genetic variation in the tortoises. Here's one of the coolest examples. Here we've got genetic variation in the iguanas, and uh, it produces striking results. Sam, what's going on with these guys? Well, what we have here, this is a, a green iguana, but it's an exanthic iguana. If you can see it there, it's actually blue. It's just, just kind of run off. Maybe we can get a picture of it uh, there. And that has a gene which uh, is, is, um, th does not allow it to have uh, yellow. Uh, uh, iguanas have three different types of pigmentation. One of them is the same pigmentation that we have for dark color, and then they have a, a yellow and a red. So if they're missing the gene that creates yellow, then they only have blue and they can't make green. That's why they're blue. And then we have here an albino iguana. And here you can see he actually has red eyes. And something that's kind of neat that we've noticed that's happened with, uh, with uh, albinism is that they're very tame unlike other guanas. You see how he's, he's taken off and he's run away? But in an albino guana, you have, a, have an iguana that ends up being a very tame animal. And so, Sam, these are some of the variations that are common or not common in the wild. I would think that they would not be common because they'd be picked off by predators. Exactly so. Very, very uncommon because an animal that, that can't camouflage itself properly is, is going to get picked off. Not only that, it, it can't thermoregulate because it doesn't, it doesn't have the proper pigmentation to to allow that, that thermal regulation to take place. So what Sam's doing here is very important and it's uh, pretty special because he's nurturing these things and he's actually raising what would normally be really rare in the wild and kind of emphasizing those uh, genetic variations so you can kind of get to see them and have them more widespread. Uh, whereas normally in the wild you wouldn't even encounter this stuff usually. Well the biggest take on that actually is that a lot of people you know, don't really like a lot of green iguanas with the, the, the aquas feel that a lot of green iguanas get let uh, go in the wild and, and disrupt the, the natural, natural ecosystem. But what we have here is, in an albino, they make a great pet because, one, they're a lot calmer. And it, when you pay uh, two or $3,000 for an albino iguana, you're not letting it go in the wild. So a lot of people like that aspect of, uh, uh, of uh, albino iguanas. So how about this side of it, Sam? We've got your yellow one here. We've got the blue one over there. Is there any difference in the skeletons, or when they're just, you know, skin and bones, do they look the same, essentially? Yeah, essentially they're the same. Okay, so if we're dealing with extinct creatures, dinosaurs or anything else, 
uh, we might have two skeletons that are just identical. We've got no idea if they had variation like that. We don't know if they had that particular kind of a genetic uh, abnormality. So these are sorts of things that we know dinosaurs would have experienced. We know that dinosaur skin would have had a number of different uh, pigments in it, and they would have had these genetic variations, but we don't know in the fossil record when that would have happened or what they exactly they would have looked like uh, without studying the likelihood of that happening by looking at creatures like this. That's how we would get an idea of what would happen back then. So why are we here today at the tortoise farm studying uh, modern tortoises when we're paleontologists? Well, Robert here has some of the most recent finds from our excavations this past summer, and he will begin explaining to you just how they fit into the entire paleoecological scene. Robert? Right. Here's a tortoise skull from a Stylemes tortoise from the White River Formation, and you can see the skull is almost identical to a modern tortoise. Uh, here's your lower jaw of the animal here. This is the eye socket here, which is called the orbit. And if you move forward, there's actually the nose opening. There's where his nostrils would have been. And there's his upper beak. So they had a beak on the top and the bottom that they would have chewed with. And this whole area back there would have been filled with jaw muscles. And that's how they would uh, get through all their tough vegetation and things. So what we're doing is we're little by little excavating this tortoise out of its block and we're studying the modern tortoises to compare and contrast all of its bones and its body functions. And what does our field assistant Robert Feeney have there, Robert? Well, Robert has a leg of a Stylomese tortoise and if you take that... And so what we've got here is a shot inside of a tortoise's shell. Here's the bottom part of the tortoise shell right here, uh, the white bone there. And this is one of the rear legs. You've got the thigh bone or the femur here, which is broken off. Here's the knee, the tibia and fibula, the lower leg. And these are all the bones of the foot. So you've got the ankle bones, you've got the toes in here, and these are all the claws of the tortoise's foot. But the interesting part is this tortoise was scavenged. So you had a predator that came in here and uh, moved in and started gnawing on the end of the leg. Those are actually gouge marks from uh, a carnivore gnawing on the end of the leg. We can study those same fight patterns today in today's animals and compare them to what was going on back there 35 million years ago without having a time machine available to us. And so from myself, our curator of Burbeck Paleontology, Robert De Palma, the assistant director of Media and Technology, Brian Fedrizzoli, and the rest of the staff of the Palm Beach Museum of Natural History, we'd like to thank you for joining us today at the Florida Iguana and Tortoise Breeders Farm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thank you.